Hello friends, welcome to EPG Parsala. Today we are going to discuss from development to governance. This lecture is part of your paper development communication. In our previous lectures, we have noticed how development was perceived globally through dominant and alternative paradigm and how the later half of 20th century actually brought in the practice of communication research in the developing nations. Works of Lerner, Rogers and Schramm, notably and many others address the issues of development communication during the first decade of development. This lecture will try to explore the issues of development that are beyond state and the engagement of various agencies and stakeholders in development. It is in fact that after globalization the role of state declined along with these stakeholders becoming extremely powerful. So besides discussing the emergence of various multilateral and bilateral agencies and their interventions in development in the earlier decades of development, we will also be looking at the changing framework of development post the Cold War period. In this module, you will learn about the transition of development to governance. It will give you an idea about the different instruments of the development that are the policies and planning and the changing roles of actors, state, international agencies, non-governmental organizations and finally individuals and how the multiple actors and agencies are engaged in competing for managing and making the process of development possible. There are several critical perspectives of thinking about development that clarifies our understanding of key concepts. Since the 70s, the Western assistance for development based on the neoclassical economic model began to be challenged as the only focus on economic growth had ignored the non-material aspects of the human development. If you recall, in our previous lectures dealing with the paradigms, we have noticed how the modernization approach created large gaps between the elite and the underprivileged. Evidences of the modernization models could be found in the imposition of macro-level policies that promoted technology adoption and foregoing of traditional cultures. The concepts of economic development have characterized the first world, second world and the third world. There are arguments regarding the governing distinctions in all these three worlds where all are aiming towards becoming modern. What is wrong in the generalized categorization of the third world on the presumption of widespread poverty and oppression? It is because the countries which most people generalize as the third world do have economic commonalities and might be lacking in the linguistic and technological integration. There might be instances where many people of the first developed world who are disadvantaged and in similar conditions of that of the third world. For the categorization of developed and developing countries as the north and south again appears overgeneralized and there are several countries in the north that are equally disadvantaged. So despite of all the arguments what is important is to highlight that the process of development are not geography specific. The critical perspectives challenged the cultural imperialism of the modernization theory and argued for the restructuring of political and economic ideologies. Though it critiqued the flaws of the earlier models for development, yet it was less successful in proposing an alternative theory. The third area of understanding the practice of development was constituted by the liberation perspective that prioritizes communal liberation and empowerment 
So what we understand here is that apart from the underlying expectations about development communication, its basic practice remains largely strategic. In our lecture on international agencies, we have learned about the emergence of the various multilateral agencies of United Nations post the Second World War that marked the commencement of development support to the Third World nations. Shortly afterwards, many bilateral agencies also came into existence within the developed nations like the United States, Agency for International Development, and many other international non-government establishments grew in the same time. United Nations replaced the earlier treatise formed by a League of Nations that was formed to assess the war refugees. It was more of a diplomatic and military agreement between as many as 47 nations. So international agencies and development, we have learned the, about the roles and functions of the various multilateral organizations that constitute the United Nations like the Inter ILO, United Nations Educa US, UNESCO, then FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, WHO, World Health Organization, United Nations Children's Fund, then UNDP, United Nations Development Program, then UNFPA. What is common in is that each of these UN establishments has official affiliations besides a set of goals to achieve. They sponsor and monitor the development support endeavors in specific areas in developing countries. Initially, post the Second World War, the main focus of the multilateral agencies of the UN was in relief and rehabilitation, work in the war ravaged Europe. But during the 50s and 60s, the attention of the UN agencies turned towards the third world countries that was home to almost two thirds of the entire global population. The assistant took the shape of restructuring economic and infrastructure planning. The 1960s was determined by the UN as the first development decade and the economic development goals of the representative of the UN were mostly consistent with the formation of bilateral aid agencies. In the 70s, under the influence of World Bank, main concerns were the integrated rural development and the 1990s also saw the structural economic adjustments and privatization of the most of the government agencies. Human development concerning human rights, living conditions, gender issues, etc. was the main agenda of the 1990s. Globalization factor led to several changes and adaptation by the UN agencies like increased association with the local NGOs, webbing of debts and providing loans for business startups in the poorer nations. We have observed in the above discussion that there has been consistency in the development goals of the underdeveloped regions and priorities of the UN agencies. All these events have basically shaped up the development that we witness today. The 1960s saw the technological transfer from the developed countries to the developing ones. As we know that modernization economic model dismissed the traditional practices that had sustained the people for years, it was believed that the Western techniques and tools were sufficient for the development in the underdeveloped nations that differed in every aspect from the Western developed countries. Development during that decade meant the adaptation of the new technologies that had ushered in developments in the already progressive countries of the North and discarding of the primitive ways of the Third World. This orientation as described by Rogers came to be known as the pro-diffusion of innovation bias. Initially, the idea of innovation transfer straightforwardly supported a radical restructuration in the traditional ways of people. 
with the realization that problems of the newly independent third world were different and thus the innovation approach facilitated the transfer of knowledge, communication and skills along with the capital and technology transfer. This process required expertise for motivating the people towards adaptation of the new modernized practices and thus soon the third world was flooded with multilateral, bilateral and other voluntary aid agencies such as UNESCO, World Bank, USAID, International Red Cross, etc. The question remains, do the international organizations really shape up the solutions offered by the state in the developing countries? In most of the developing countries, various ministries of the governments have an extension function. The history of such outreach function of the government could be traced back to the earlier decade of development when people had to be convinced through persuasive ways of communication for adapting to the new transformed ways of life. Such a service fell under the extension or outreach functions of the government. The extension services were not known to many African countries until the USAID sent their experts for agricultural extension programs in the 60s. Development scholars noted that in spite of the various attempts, the US agricultural extension model could not be developed in the developing countries. What we understand here is that the extension services were based on the innovations methodology. Unfortunately, the innovation transfer approach decided which innovation would be best suited for the developing nations without actually considering the real existing situations. I learner studied the links between development that was linked with increased industrialization and economic activity and the various modernization variables like the mass media, literacy, urbanization, participation of people, etc. In the earlier years of development, mass media were not widespread in the developing nations. So most of the extension services had to depend on alternative ways of persuasion. In some nations where radio had a reach to create awareness, the content was not likely. So the extension approach relied on the most receptive channels of communication for reaching out to the farmers. Another major drawback of the extension services of the developed world was its limited individual reach. According to Lerner and SRAM, literacy, participation and mass media communication channels were the means for mobilizing the masses for overcoming the traditionalism and accept the culture of change. We have learned in one of our previous lectures how unlike the West, the diffusion of innovation approach did not come out with the desired results in the developing world. There had been numerous changes since 1991 and the major among them was the end of Cold War. Due to these changes, no particular remedy was found appropriate for the development issues. End of Cold War brought several religious and ethnic conflicts, emphasizing on the needs of social division for implementation of development process. This led to the emergence of environmental and feminist movements altering the traditional ways of thinking. Globalization, which was one of the major changes, had made the associations between development communication process 
and processes of socio-economic development a bit complex? It is because advancement of technologies is making the information flow much faster, suggesting new development communication ways in which some instances might create dilemmas with the existing strategies. So what we understand here is that the 21st century is vastly different in terms of community, human welfare, participatory initiatives and transparent modes of communications. The innovations during the Cold War era were basically uniform in nature and implemented neoclassical economic mechanisms and perspectives. In, I mean, in other words, we can say that the major factor in the spread of scientific development discourse was the monolithic organized structure established by the Western world. What is meant here is that during the earlier decades of development, the Western developed view was considered to be the world view. However, the legitimacy of the earlier models of development was being challenged in terms of scientific and economic critiques post 1990s. If you see the development agenda post Second World War was backed by science and social scientists opine that the world was ready for economic and political expansion. However, during the Cold War period, the superpowers were struggling to make associations for influencing and shaping the world's structure as per their own interest. On the other hand, the newly independent nations of Asia, Latin America and Africa from the colonized rule imagined for a federal state centrally governed and with strategic economic plans and policies. And now the most significant agenda for development in the developing nations was set by the expectations of the people. Here in this context, the role of NGOs is significant as that acts as an intermediary. We have earlier learned about the role of NGOs in development in earlier lectures. The NGOs have had a strong presence in the field of development since the Second World War and they have varied roles including through research and efforts to support the less fortunate and underprivileged people. The growth of the role of NGOs as agencies of development in the underdeveloped countries has been rapid post the Second World War. This could be stated as a consequence of the depressing outcome of the conventional development strategies for alleviating poverty by the state agencies. Initiatives of NGOs were basically small scale and decentralized and were funded by foreign benefactors for promoting self-development and participatory efforts at the grassroots level. In the 21st century, the major consequences of the participatory and self-development initiatives are empowerment and liberty. It was believed that participatory development projects that were run by NGOs could lead to vital social improvements. We are aware that knowledge sharing can mobilize the people and their knowledge of the vast resources. The role of NGOs and other development agencies are that of an outsider. It is expected that the knowledge and experience of rural people would be more than that of an outsider. So with new approaches of development, the agencies as a part of their extension services encouraged balanced exchange of ideas and knowledge at the grassroots level. Scholars noted that various agencies have gained from such access to the storehouse of knowledge. From self-development initiatives arises the idea of de development support communication leading towards a social change model. Interestingly, in the academic literature, one of the major restructuration has been the evolution of development, support communication from development communication. After some initial opposition, the idea of development support 
communication received, acceptance among the various multilateral organizations of United Nations like the UNICEF, FAO and UNDP, the truth about the social conditions in most of the underdeveloped countries is that majority of the people at the rural grassroots level are trapped in situations of dependency with mostly unequal and stratified socioeconomic structure. Hence, participatory approaches are considered essential as the low status conferred to certain groups obstructs awareness initiative of the state. In fact, one of the reports of FAO in 1977 commended the incorporation of the interpersonal and participatory communication approaches in development strategies. However, the development support communication strategies were never completely accepted by the development agencies. One reason could be that participatory communication was mostly misunderstood and lack of familiarity. Development communication was shaped by the ideologies of dominant paradigm, whereas development support communication was popularized by the practitioners in response to the realities of third world countries. In the new global paradigm of development, concentration of power is no longer limited to development agencies, multinationals, media or any other stakeholders. It is rather transformed among the larger demographics. This shift of development power surpasses time and information spaces generating larger profits and restructuring the global markets. What we gather from the above argument is that the role of development support communication specialists like the NGOs cannot be discarded as a major aid to the growth process. We can say that the new developmentalism enabled institutional interventions in the underdeveloped countries. It led to the incorporation of different frameworks for addressing the development problems. So further, the revolutions in the field of information communication technologies have given a fresh perspective to the understanding of development communication. From the mid-70s, communication role in the development process changed considerably with the evolution of ICT. It became increasingly clear that ICT tools have immense potential in bringing development in rural areas. Conclusively, user-initiated activities supported by ICT led to reassessment of the roles of conventional mass media in development along with the re revising of development communication concepts like participation and feedback. In this lecture, we discuss the various issues of development and role of state and different agencies. It clearly shows that it is no more the monopoly of the state. In fact, it opens up to larger issues of governance. So development is no more the mere agenda of the state. Rather, it's a larger issue of multiple stakeholders to be involved. While understanding the concept of developed and developing nations, we observe that the terms development and underdevelopment are no more confined between any geographical boundaries. We examine the vital role and impact of the United Nations and various other multilateral agencies in development issues, planning and practices. We also learn that over the decades the United Nations had become a key global stakeholder in the sector of development communication, both from theoretic and functional perspectives. We also learned about the emergence and role of NGOs as a stakeholder for development, especially in the grassroots level. This lecture summarizes about the framework of new development and development communication that has shaped up with the disintegrating of the Cold War and initially with the idea of evolution of state welfare measures, but along with the decline 
with the welfare measures, we find that independent international agencies and other forms of civil society um, agencies are coming forward. So this is why it opens up a larger question and issues for governance. Do attempt the question in the self-evaluate quadrant for further reading suggestions. Please refer to the third quadrant. Thank you.